Well, good morning and welcome to the second virtual Indiana Wildlife Conference. My name is Emily Wood and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Wildlife Federation. And on behalf of our staff and board, we are so excited that you are joining us virtually or watching the recorded link later. Um, there are a handful of speakers um, that I've heard over my career that make me say, wow, everybody should hear this person. And so I am so truly honored today that we have Jim McCormick and Dr. Babe, Mamie Parker uh, here with us today. I've seen both of these uh, folks presenting and they are both um, those kinds of people that, that I feel like everyone should hear. So I'm just really ecstatic that we could have them both here together on the same day in the same event. So I'm, I'm really excited about the morning that we get to share together. Before we get started, I know we all are very um, accustomed to the Zoom world that we live in now, but I just wanted to cover some of the basics. This of course is a webinar setting. So your cameras and microphones are automatically turned off. You don't have to worry about any uh, debacles there. Um, closed captioning for this can be turned on at the bottom of the screen. If you, if you move your cursor over the bottom, there should be a panel that pops up where you can turn on or off automatic closed captioning for anyone who wishes to utilize that. Um, to ask questions of our speakers, of course, we're, we're lucky enough today to have um, sort of a live element of this to be able to do a Q&A with our speakers. The way that you will do that is through the Q&A function, also at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question to ask of either uh, Jim McCormick or Dr. Parker today, you can just type it into that um, Q&A section there. Uh, we have someone monitoring that. It's going to help me um, get all those questions together so that hopefully in the time that we have allotted, we can, we can uh, answer all the questions that we have. Um, with the chat feature, that's another feature that you can use today. That's to interact with other guests. So um, if folks are talking or if you want to get in a bidding war in the silent auction, you guys can do that um, in the chat feature and interact with each other as though we were sitting at tables together. Um, we will be providing option updates, of course, um, throughout. You've probably seen Ray Watkins popping up in the chat, teasing out some items there. Make sure that you head over to our amazing silent auction. All right, let's get this thing kicked off. I'm gonna turn over to our board president, Rick Cochran. Thank you, Emily. Thanks everybody for being with us on this beautiful yet brisk Hoosier morning. Bear with us as we having, we're having our second virtual conference, um, we thought, we were going to do this one time last year, but all of us have had to learn to adapt with COVID and the Wildlife Federation is certainly no exception. I'd like to start off by thanking Emily and others that served on the planning committee for this conference. Uh, Tom Holman, the chair of the planning committee, Ray Watkins, the chair of the silent auction, uh, Wildlife Federation board member, Tina Mayhern and John Goss and other uh, individuals who volunteered to be on the uh, uh, planning committee. Uh, also, I'd like to call your attention to the Wildlife Federation website to check out the biography of board members. I think you'll be impressed with the talent that we have on the board of directors that govern the Federation. The board and staff have worked uh, tirelessly to put together a conference. Uh, we were originally planning to be live and in person at Fort Harrison State Park, but following the recent uh, surge in the virus, we decided that it was an your best interest and our best interest and our guests' best interest to go virtual. We've got two great speakers, as Emily mentioned. Uh, we've pared down some of the time to be respectful of your time and your attention span on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, before I turn it back over to Emily, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors to make this possible, the National Wildlife Federation, the Indianapolis Zoo, the law firm of Palouse, Shadley, Racher, and Braun, the Central Indiana Land Trust, Wild Birds Unlimited, Empower Results, Indiana Land Protection Alliance, Native Plants Unlimited, Blue Aster Studio, the White River Alliance, the Indiana Parks Alliance, and Moving Water Outfitters. And as Emily has already mentioned, check out some of the cool stuff on the silent auction. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Emily to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Emily, you want to start over? You're on mute. See, this is why we invited her. 
Dr. Parker's on point this morning more than me. Thank you. I'm so excited um, to uh, invite Dr. Parker here to speak. Um, we've seen her speak several um, different times through the National Wildlife Federation and have served on a, a, a few different um, committees with her, which has been a great honor. Um, Dr. Parker is a professional fish and wildlife biologist. She's a success coach and principal consultant at Ecologic Group. Uh, she has spent a career as a biologist and senior executive in the federal government as the Fish and Wildlife Service Chief of Staff, is Assistant Director of Habitat Conservation and Head of Fisheries um, in this country. So she is known for her public speaking throughout the environmental community and Dr. Parker made history serving as the very first African-American woman um, in the Fish and Wildlife Service to serve as a regional director of the 13 Northeastern states after she worked here in the Great Lakes region and uh, the Big Rivers regions and um, in the southeastern part of the United States, which is where she's from. Um, the governor of Arkansas honored her work by enshrining her into the Arkansas, uh, Arkansas Outdoor Hall of Fame for her work on uh, fish habitat plans and invasive species. Uh, she's the recipient of the Emmeline Moore Award, named after the very first female president of the American Fisheries Society for mentoring and coaching women and people of color. Um, Dr. Parker is an author, uh, she has published The Future of Fisheries, Perspectives for Emerging Professionals, published by the American Fisheries Society. And we are so very excited to have her here today um, to share her thoughts and vision on our pivotal stretch to make the best better. So if we could all imagine a very loud round of applause, um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Mamie Parker. Thank you so much, Emily, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here this morning. Uh, it's, it's really a great kind introduction that you've given me and I certainly, certainly appreciate it. To Richard, uh, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate you and your invitation as well. Uh, we are so sorry that we can't be there in person. It would have been wonderful to be able to interact and mingle uh, with you all. However, we are all snuggled in our uh, places here in, the, in where I live and other places uh, in a warm environment. Um, I am here near the banks of the Potomac River uh, in Northern Virginia, outside of the Washington DC area. I can walk to the river. Uh, those river, that river and those lands, I acknowledge them because they are the home of the Iroquois as well as the Algonquian natives and the ancestors of Pocahontas. Uh, they roam those lands. I respect those lands and really, really appreciate the honor of being able to enjoy uh, fishing uh, and walking and picnicking along the banks of the Potomac River. So uh, it's so great to be in the presence of greatness. So hello, 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 members, hello, board members, affiliates, hello, everyone that's out there in the National Wildlife Federation family. Uh, I do consider you all family, uh, and I'm honored to have the uh, privilege to serve on the National Board of the National Wildlife uh, Federation, where I have learned to appreciate your work and what you do and why you are where you are. Uh, I serve as the co-chair now of the uh, Partnerships and Coalition um, uh, Committee, and uh, it gives me a great opportunity to see the wonderful work that you all are doing throughout the country. We stand for wildlife, and I know you do too, in the Great Lakes region, in, the, in your state of Indiana, uh, whether you're working in the Great Lakes, the Wabash, Wabash River, the Ohio River, the Kankakee, the Maumee, uh, the Potoka, all those rivers uh, that I've had the privilege uh, uh, of working with folks in over the years. And speaking of working with folks over the years, I know there might be one person in the audience that I do know because we had a chance to work together at US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as on the National Fish Habitat uh, Action Plan. Glenn Salmon uh, was the former director of your agency and it is my, my pleasure to have the honor of working with him. I have a few slides, I won't uh, be long, uh, but I'll take a few minutes uh, to show uh, some of those uh, slides just so we can um, can get started here and let's see of course got to make sure they move this is the biggest challenge we have right there we go so um so today as I think about 
a rapidly changing world, which is what we're in, uh, I thought that we could um, talk about making our best better uh, because we know that this world is changing and has changed over the years. And the National Wildlife Federation being the largest and most trusted conservation organization in existence for all the years, you guys have been around for over 80 some years. And um, uh, your job and the job of the National Wildlife Federation, of course, is to increase population so they thrive even in a rapidly changing world. And so when I was thinking about the changing world, of course, we know that we have a change when it comes to climate change. We know that there's a change uh, in our world when we think about the pandemic. And of course, social justice too is something that we can no longer stop talking about. We can't ignore it. My mama used to say, ignore your teeth and they'll uh, go away, they'll rot away. And so now we are faced with, and our challenges ahead of us are to really, really think about the things that we have to uh, deal with now. And so uh, I, I decided to call this presentation uh, the fact that we have to pivot and then we have to make our best better. And when I think about the definition of pivot, which I think is important for us to think about because we're doing this now. I serve as a commissioner for the Department of Wildlife Resources here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And when I was appointed by the governor, one of the things that he, I can remember him saying is that, you know, we're there to make transformational changes and pivoting is all about transformational changes. And we did that because we changed the name of the agency to the Department of Wildlife Resources uh, was one example, but pivoting, the definition is about turning, about our central point, looking at our central point to see where it is and how it can change. It's oscillating, it's about road rotating, a rapidly changing world will retire, require us to pivot. And so my next slide, this slide here talks about pivoting and what have we learned from the pandemic that will uh, make us think about pivoting. Now, pivoting is not, uh, doesn't mean failure. It sometimes means opportunity. And so as we think today, think about your organization, where you are, where you want to go, think about what is it that we can do better uh, what kind of opportunities, what kind of crazy dreams that you might have out there, ideas, new beginnings that might be there. Speaking of new beginnings, as you see here, one of my very, very close friends, Joanne Jenkins is the head of AARP. And she shared this with me from all the research that they've done. Here are some of the things that we all have to consider as we think about pivoting and as we think about the pandemic. The one that stands out for me, of course, is the fact that you know, hard times bring about opportunities. But also at the bottom of that list, the fact that nature matters because many of us have had to rely on nature as we moved and got out. Pivoting, making our best better. We think about your priorities and the priorities of the National Wildlife Federation. We know that our priorities are all about education. They're about advocacy and action. Actions, that's the one that's most important to me. I tell people all the time too, that mama said when all is said and done, sometimes more is said than done. So we have to make sure we move because nothing happens unless something moves. And when you think about things that will need to move in these categories, we have different tools that we'll have to think about using as we move ahead and look for opportunities, techniques, and certainly, certainly alternative communications to different groups of people, uh, being more inclusive. And how do we promote sound, climate, smart conservation? So Nas, I, I love, love, love the blues. I grew up listening to uh, country and Western music and I'm an old school girl cause Kenny Rogers is still one of my favorite. When he says through the years, you never let me down. You never turned around. I'm so glad I stayed right here with you through the years. Uh, that song means a lot because I feel like that's what happened for me in conservation. But I just want to give you a little bit of a background. Emily asked me to share some of my background with you for those of you who haven't heard it before. But Nas, I, in addition to liking country and western and growing up in the Mississippi Delta, 
Boy, I had a chance to hear blues, 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 blues. And I tell people I love the blues, but I don't have the blues. But Nas, okay, I'm learning to be uh, really uh, working with five generations in the work that I do. Uh, I've learned to accept and appreciate some good rap. And turning nothing to something by Nas really, really resonates with me. As I look at this picture, my mother was a sharecropper in northern Louisiana and Southern Arkansas, mostly in Southern Arkansas, right on the Mississippi River near um, the uh, Overflow Creek National Wildlife Refuge. And there she also served as a maid when she wasn't sharecropping and raising cotton, living in a house, this house where uh, like this, where we uh, had, uh, she had already had five boys and five girls and she was about to have her 11th child. And people wonder why you can, these children can pick a whole lot of cotton. And so my mother though, she knew that life would be a little tough for this girl growing up in the segregated South, growing up in the segregated South that was legal and segregated. And so she thought about it and she was an avid angler a great gardener. And she thought, well, you know, there's something that I wanna do special for her. And I'm gonna take her outdoors with me. She loved, loved, loved the outdoors. A great botanist with an eighth grade education, but taught me a lot about botany. A great mentor and coach. As we pivot, we need to think about the people we need to lift as we climb because there are a lot of people suffering, whether it's in education, whether it's in advocacy, whether it's in our volunteers and action um, that will need some mentoring and coaching as we go along. I have so many mama said uh, uh, quotes that uh, resonates with me and hopefully you will too. She took me fishing on the banks of Bayou Bartholomew in Southern Arkansas, one of which I remember was I had just learned to uh, read. And I said, look, mom, I can read mama, me mom, my dear, whatever we uh, called her. And it was a Coca-Cola bottle and it had on it no deposit, no return. If we were in person, I'd have you to repeat that. No deposit, no return. In fact, I'm going to ask you now to type that in the chat because we know that that is not just a phrase about taking a Coke bottle back to be recycled, one of the first recycling programs in this country. But that word, those words are also about, about how we need to make deposits to get returns. No deposit, no return. Let me see if you and who hear you out there, who are you and what you think about that, that, that phrase. Mama said that to me. She says, in life, you have to make deposits to get return. Uh, one of my other favorite ones that she said, you know, we watched birds and boy, were we fortunate. Uh, we did not grow up too far from Stuttgart, Arkansas. And I just became a member of the board of directors of the Ducks Unlimited. And boy, 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 do I have some great people that I have a chance to work with on a national level. However, most of them are usually green with envy when they uh, discover that I had the privilege of growing up close to Stuttgart, Arkansas, not too far away to duck country. And it was uh, here that my mother taught me a lot of things and I had a chance to see a lot of species. But what I remember the most, one of the best quotes was leap and grow your wings on the way down. And here she was saying, take those risks in a rapidly changing world where we're looking at advocacy, where we're looking at actions and where we're looking at educating people so we can have populations, wildlife populations, where we can have clean water in the Great Lakes, where we can avoid uh, having to deal with the, 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 the invasive species and all of that, that sometimes we have to take risks to get things done. And so this me message stuck with me over the years. Uh, my mother was really impressed with Eisenhower. He had come to Little Rock and encourage the governor to segregate Little Rock Central High School during the same month in which I was born. He was born the same day I was born, or she often reminded me, you were born on the president's birthday. But it was because she thought that I would be a boy and she really wanted a boy. She said, I'm gonna name my baby after the president. Well, I'm so glad mama didn't name me Ike, but she did name me Mamie. Mamie was the first lady in the country. Again, 
looking to educate others, looking to be, and she encouraged me to be that first lady that will go out and educate people. Here's a picture of me returning to Central High School on the 50th anniversary of the, um, of the Central High School integration process and, um, and being able to, um, to really celebrate some of the things that happened at Central High School, lifting as we climb, educating being important. You know the importance of advocacy too and how important it is for us to advocate for the things that we need and look out for. For example, we really have to make our best better and get that Recovering America's Wildlife Act passed and encouraging our senators to pass that act because look what it does for us. Conservation and restoration, some of the greatest conservation needs that you have in the state of Indiana, whether you're dealing with uh, uh, lamprey, sturgeon, alligator gar, bowfin, shad, common carp, whether you're dealing with silver carp, big head carp, whether you're dealing with Indiana bats, whether you're dealing with uh, Clean Water Act issues, it's time for us to get that bill passed so that we can look at some non-game species uh, that are needed and work needed to be done in all of our 52 states as well as territories in the D and DC. That act will also help us when it comes to education and recreational projects, as well as threatening and endangered uh, recovery grants that the Department of Interior will be issuing. And so that's one of the things that I'm sure you've heard about. I'll be testifying in a couple of weeks before Congress on this. And this is something that we really believe is so important, advocacy and why that's important. Making our best better. And as I think about that and what you all do in terms of actions with your volunteers and others, collaborative affiliates, your uh, work is certainly ne necessary bringing members together as well as volunteers as we work hard for fisheries, wildlife, invasive species, uh, endangered and imperil, imperil species that we need to stay connected. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to join the Conservation Corps. My teacher in the ninth grade, he introduced me to Marvin Gaye's songs. Marvin Gaye sang, mercy, mercy me. He said, things are not like they used to be. He said, what happened to our blue skies? And he said, radiation in the air. And he said, the air that we breathe. And then he said, fish full of mercury. And fish full of mercury certainly what resonated with me as I thought about the fact that a large percentage of the protein in my diet came from the land. It came from fish because that's what the only uh, meat that we could actually have. And so he basically said that we need to do something. We need to get involved. He said we need to be bold and take risks. And he encouraged me, that ninth grade teacher. And that's why I think it's important to become a volunteer, to become a member of some organization that would protect nat natural wildlife. He did not encourage me to go into conservation. We did not have any role models. Being a woman at the time in the 70s, you did not see women in my circle of influence, and you certainly didn't see Black women doing it. But over time, I was able to move on uh, and find um, the people that actually did what I wanted to do. And they knew how important it was. And these folks were at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so this is where my journey started, uh, understanding the value of protecting natural resources and understanding why it was important for us. So while it started here, Bayou Bartholomew in Southern Arkansas, Cypress Swamp area, uh, right now, I've had the privilege of working all over the country and going all over the world, uh, understanding, learning, educating, being educated, being able to be an advocate, but also learning about advocacy, learning to lead by example, trusting my gut, saying sometimes what I mean as I get older and bolder, that becomes easier. But here are all the places that I had the privilege of working uh, before retiring at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, starting a new life. What I feel like when we think about and talk about actions and how to get others engaged, we certainly 
have to think about what Colin O'Mara says, our president of National Wildlife uh, Federation, when he says saving nature saves us. And I think that's so important. And how do we make that connection? You all are doing it in the Great Lakes. One of your priorities, of course, is about clean drinking water and how that's so important. I have to figure out how to do it with my cousins, Marcus and Keith and Claudine and Claudette in Chicago. And so I make that connection with them by talking about clean water, clean fish will give them clean food to eat. Our messaging will have to change so we can make sure that we have a lot more people on board as we move along. So I had a chance to work in Wisconsin uh, and, and with all intentions of going south, uh, my next job after I left Wisconsin, I got a chance to go back south to, uh, to Arkansas to graduate. And then my next job was in Candy, Ohio County, Minnesota. Uh, with all intentions of going south, uh, my next job was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, but finally, after going to Madison, Wisconsin and staying for many years, I had a chance to move uh, head south to Missouri, working with the farmers. And we know how important our agricultural practices are and restoration on farmland and educating farmers, making their best better in this rapidly changing world and how much influence they will have over conservation. And so I had a chance to work in, on the Farm Bill program, which really gave us an opportunity to do some great things. Hopefully you still will support uh, Farm Bill activities because they are so important. But it was here that I had to also learn to work um, with a, a supervisor and learn more about actions. And as I talk about making our, our best actions better, uh, when we do that, we need to think about, again, proving we are problem solvers, whether we are volunteers. And I see we have almost 80 participants on the, uh, here today. Again, hopefully you are affirming that you will be and help be a problem solver and that we don't always take things personal when, when they don't go our way. And so I know you hear a lot about conservation in these meetings. I want us to talk about people. Because if we think about what we're doing and why we're doing it, most of which is for the benefit of the people. And I was so happy when the US Fish and Wildlife Service finally put that statement, that phrase in their uh, mission statement. And, um, and it was during my time that my tenure there at Fish and Wildlife Service. I hope as you look at your statements, as you look at your charters uh, for your committees and everything that you, really, really uh, think about and put the people up front so people will understand why you're doing what you're doing. And um, because sometimes people don't, and that's when it trickles down into your strategies and your actions. Uh, you have to think about people in this whole puzzle. I learned that in that job in Missouri, simply because this was the first time really in my career over the years that I had worked at Fish and Wildlife Service that I worked for a farmer, uh, worked with a farmer, and he did not have a lot of respect or uh, didn't support the federal government at all. And it was here that I heard him say that he didn't believe that there was anything that we could do for him. In fact, this was the first time when I experienced some gender inequities when he basically said that I was a woman that should be home having babies. And these things are very hard and it's hard not to take them personal. Uh, but uh, over time, our best lessons to make our best better, we have to get over it, uh, get angry and get over it. They say I live not too far from the home of, of Colin Powell here in Northern Virginia, not too far from the rest of Virginia where our headquarters are for the National Wildlife uh, Federation. Colin Powell says, get mad and get over it. No one wants to be around an angry person. This was a really important lesson for me because based on some of the things, as you can imagine, growing up in the segregated South that I grew up in, that I've been told in so many uh, terms, in so many ways that I was not enough. I've been told many times, not just being a woman, but a black woman, that I didn't belong. Of course, I've been uh, told 
many times that I was substandard to many. And in fact, when I was third grade, I integrated my third grade class. And I can recall sitting in that class day after day after day when the parents of the children basically said they shouldn't talk to me uh, because we didn't belong. But it was one day, it was one day in particular, this little girl, Paula Spurlock, and she had little ringlets just like I have. And I think even to this day, I live my life like Paula Spurlock because little Paula with her blue eyes and blonde hair came up to me and she said, here, take this, this gum and chew it. She said, it always makes me feel better. And she said, and look, I know they don't play with you. And she said, but I'm gonna change that. She said, because my mommy said, I'm a leader. And she made all the difference in the world for me in my first year at that school. And she was the one that made me know that when we get to know people and who they are, we are in a better place. And so I know there's a lot of little Paulas out there that understand that actions will be what will make a difference and that you can too reach out and touch. Uh, and expect change over time, but also move with the change. And so uh, I was in Missouri for a number of years and eventually I had a chance to go to Minneapolis and love Minneapolis and went to Atlanta, Georgia. Finally made it south. My best should have been better, but I had a bad relationship with my boss, practiced those four cancers of life. As we look at educating, advocacy, as well as actions as volunteers and other work that we're doing in terms of conservation and restoration. If we practice these four cancers of life that Dr. Covey talks about, we will not be successful. Our best will not be better. I practice every one of them. What I've learned over the years and with the help of the National Conservation Training Center at NCTC in Shepherdstown and other places, that these cancers of life will kill you. Criticizing, what I know now that I criticized my boss, that I was talking to the wrong person about him. I complained a lot. What I know now is 80% of the people we complain to, guess what? They don't care. And the other 20% of the people we complain to, they're so happy that whatever happened to you is not happening to them. So it doesn't do much to do that. Competition is good when it's the right kind of competition, but you know what I mean, and you probably have ideas of what I'm talking about as we think about educating, as we think about advocacy, as we think about our actions and our volunteer work to restore and uh, to conserve our natural resources. I'm talking about the competition that's really not good for any of us. And so those four cancers of life, those are the ones that I would like for you now to take a few minutes to think about while I take a drink of water, which one of these cancers of life would you like to stop doing? And you know them for yourself. Um, and what I tell people, when they know what they need to do, they tell others that. And so again, in the chat, I'm gonna see who will say, I know what I need to do. Me personally, over time, I learned to know my crazy. And so if I had you there in the audience all together, I would ask you to ask your neighbor, do you know you're crazy? And so if you know you're crazy, write in the chat, I know my crazy, and tell me which one of these you'd like to stop working on. Is it criticizing? Is it complaining? Is it competing? Is it comparing? Give me your crazies. In, your, in the inbox. I'm gonna take a, a drink of water. I'm almost done. Any crazies in the box? Are you guys still with me? Let's see. Do we have any crazies in the box? There's some coming in. Yes, there are some chat. Crazy. Criticizing, complaining, negatively competing and comparing. There we go. I see some crazies coming in, Emily. And we have to really, really overcome those crazies and know how to work them out. Look at them, they are coming in. I'm almost, I can see, thank you for sharing. And what I've learned from mama, mama said, when you see crazy on one side of the street, cross over to the other side. So when you see your crazy coming, 
know it's coming, acknowledge it, and move on. One of the crazies that I have too is fear. I'm working on fear. I've learned that fear has paralyzed me in many cases. I just read a book that I really, really love, and I keep reading passages from it, and it's called The Year of Yes. It was written by the same woman that's written many of the episodes of Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, and other television shows, um, and she writes about uh, The Year of Yes because of her fears that really, really got the best of her. And when we want our best better, we need to think about those. And she wrote this book about um, the year of yes, where she said a yes to a lot of things. And this is what I had to do. So my fear was leaving the field after 20 years and moving to Washington. And it was really hard. But after I had such a bad relationship with my uh, boss and practice those four cancers of life, I realized that I needed to move on. I needed to say yes. It was in the Washington DC office where I moved to the director's office in one of the most coveted positions in this country. That job allowed us to do a lot with migratory birds. It allowed us to do a lot and learn a lot about uh, many of the other programs out West that I never had a chance to work in. But it was here that I also learned about the importance of really, really working uh, ways in which I could overcome many of the fears, whether it was a call to the White House or, or, or a trip to Capitol Hill, all of those things were fearful to me over time. And so I moved to Washington as the uh, chief of staff or what, what is the special assistant to the director and it was here that um, really our country had started and our agency had really started looking and working uh, on more on diversity. And uh, over the years, I wanted everybody to see me as a great scientist, didn't wanna be viewed as a great biologist. I mean, wanted to be a great biologist, didn't wanna be known as the black biologist or the black whatever. But over the years, what I realized is that that empowers others to see who you are and what challenges that you've overcome. So you out there, volunteers, affiliates, board members, understand how valuable it is and how much uh, it, important it is to have collaborative efforts going on and ways in which you can um, talk to other affiliates and talk to other members to work together. Because sometimes, it's underestimated those values. Yes, it might take more time. Certainly the payoffs are worth it. I have a chance to work uh, with the National Wildlife Federation on creating safe places. And if you haven't had a chance yet to see some of the work that we've done, um, they have it on their website, but putting together people that have told us about their experiences uh, when it comes to safe places, whether or not it's in the boardroom, in the conference room, whether or not it's doing volunteer work, we want to make sure that all people, no matter where they come from or what they do, feel like they belong. And so I want to encourage you all to do something at your own affiliate level to look at how can you look for ways to create safe places. Um, so uh, I left, I left uh, the, the Washington office, became the head of the region, um, the Northeast region in this country, did a lot of great work, worked with a lot of great people. National Wildlife Refuge System was really big in that region and allowed us to do a lot of great things there. I know many of you all have worked on a lot of, with a lot of National Wildlife Refuges uh, because uh, public land management is so important. And one of the things that we're really, really promoting is climate smart conservation on these lands, but also large landscape conservation. And we got a chance to do a lot of that uh, work and start a lot of that work in the Northeast. I came back to Washington head of fisheries, but also marine mammals was a part of my portfolio. Uh, and the staff in Alaska did a lot of this, and we had a chance to go and see a lot of the impacts of climate change and what it was doing. Uh, again, a rapidly changing world looking for our, making our best better. 
Once I left the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the age of 50, uh, I, I left my husband uh, at the time, my late husband at the time, um, was um, was sick with uh, stomach cancer and, and about to die. But prior to that, he wanted to make sure that I understood what my priorities were. And so at the time, he uh, asked for divorce and he said, you're married to your job. Here's my message to you volunteers and a lot of you all, the work that you're doing, make sure you have time for yourself and get tired, rest, but don't quit. I'm not encouraging anybody to quit, but take the rest that you need uh, to get along, to move on. And so at the end of the day, he and I uh, decided to stay together. He did, we got the counseling that we need, needed to make our marriage the best better. Uh, and then I uh, ended up staying, uh, leaving the Fish and Wildlife Service, but had a career after that. And this is my encore life, part of which was to visit and work on an exchange program in Africa. And what I found there is something that I believe that will help you make your best better when it comes to doing it, uh, doing it scared, doing it anyway, understanding life can be hard, but life is long. Working at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I remember this day and will never forget it. We had one of our employees that was on Flight 93 that was um, the plane that was about to hit from where we understand the White House. Uh, however, many on that plane knew what was about to happen. And so they went around and got all their resources, whatever they could find, pencils, pens, scissors, whatever they could use. They went and found it on that plane. And we had a member of our staff on that plane. And from what I understand, they got in a huddle before they went to overcome those hijackers. And they said, with limited resources, let's roll. In our rapidly changing world, making our best better, we're never going to have all the resources that we need. But we need to make sure that we let our best, uh, make our best roll. Um, I talked about my uh, former husband, my late husband. He passed away about 15 years ago, no, 12 years ago now. I uh, recently got married, married a man uh, doing uh, the COVID on the Potomac River, as you can see. Wonderful quotes from him. The one that I encourage you all to think about uh, in times like this as we are pivoting, making our best better is to go and work your dreams. And again, if I had you with me, we would be singing one of my favorite songs because it was a song that my mother encouraged me to sing when things were not always good. That song was roll, roll, roll your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. That song has many meanings. Let me see if you're still with me. Tell your neighbor to roll, roll, roll your boat. Tell your neighbor right in the chat, roll your boat, roll your boat. Because my mother said, sometimes we need to roll our boats as we make our best better working with others. Sometimes we're too busy rowing somebody else's boat. Roll, roll, roll your boat. And then it says, that means sometimes stay in your lane. And then it says gently. This is the one that I like. A lot of times when we are looking for great opportunities, transformational uh, changes, leadership and all of that, it doesn't always require us to be moving fast. As a woman leader in Fish and Wildlife Service, I learned that I could not be the Rambo type of leader, that I had to lead by example and that I had to encourage. And my style was quite different, gently. And then it says down the stream, that means keep moving. And I love Madagascar and I love movies. That one says, I like to move it, move it, move it. So move it, keep moving as you make your best better. And then it says merrily, that one I really love because that's all about choosing happiness. As you go work your dreams, choose happiness. And then it says, life is but a dream. I dream that you, I'll continue to do wonderful work in, in the state of, of Indiana, that you work closely with Richard and 
Emily and others that are out there doing great things in the outdoors. And remember to make your best better. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm going to, I have a few minutes, do I? Um, anything? Any yeah, I have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Parker, I just really want to thank you for that message. That was so amazing. And I'm ready to row my boat. I'm sure that everyone else here is, is getting their uh, paddles in the water. Thank you so much, Dr. Parker. Thank you. I've heard from the from uh, Emily. I've heard, who's that? Taylor McCoy. I see lots of folks. Amanda, thanks, Amanda. Stephanie, thank you so much, Amber, Megan. Any questions? There's Amber again. All right. Thank you, Amber. Thanks, Leslie. We, uh, like we, we do have one question that came through here from uh, Gwen, who said, if would, asked if you would speak um, to the opportunities for working with mul multicultural urban audiences. Well, yes, I really think that that's important. And one of the great things about the, uh, the National Wildlife Federation, they understand the value of that. I've been working really hard and trying to challenge my colleagues here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I serve on the board of the, uh, of the Nature Conservancy and feel like that there's, role, there's a bigger role that they can play in cities. And so one of the things that I encourage us to do is look for non-traditional partners. Uh, I think we sometimes stick with the same people, Gwen, uh, but have we thought about the healthcare industry? Have we thought about going, and I know some people are going to faith-based organizations. I think that's wonderful. Uh, we at the National Wildlife Federation just uh, partnered with the Lynx Incorporated. You write this down. This is a great organization and I'm sure they have a couple of chapters in Indiana. It's uh, The Lynx, L-I-N-K-S, The Lynx Incorporated. They are like the Black Junior League. They are required. We are. I'm a member, and so is uh, several other people that you might know if I call their names. We're required to do uh, 48 hours of volunteer work every year. In fact, last year, we, uh, and Tina says we have a Lynx chapter in Indiana. Reach out to them because they have a partnership with the uh, National Wildlife Federation uh, to build pollinator gardens, but also to build awareness. We're trying to do more work in the environmental justice arena. Uh, they, uh, I see here, Stephanie said they're doing amazing work. And so we have some great articles in our magazine, the National Wildlife Federation magazines about the work that the Lynx are doing. Again, environmental justice is something that they want to get more involved in in the year to come. We'll be doing more work on, in the environmental justice world. So that's one example. I think sororities and fraternities are another one. The US Fish and Wildlife Service they have a partnership with a, a national sorority where they're doing work. Look for some of those uh, organizations locally. When I was in Washington, we were talking about ways that we could help in our contaminants program because we realized after doing some research in the Chesapeake Bay uh, that a lot of medicine was causing a lot of problems with the fish and the physiology of the fish and, uh, in, and the anatomy of the fish in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And uh, we uh, reached out to the America, American Pharmaceutical Association and developed one of the first relationships and partnerships. And now you see all over the country where we're recycling our medicine and, and doing it smart disposal. Again, a non-traditional partner. But what about if we were to go in communities of color and think about what the medical professionals would be able to offer us as they think about uh, exercise, as they think about the outdoors, as they think about one group that I heard about that's called Park Rx, and that's doctors that are prescribing uh, medication for um, for kids about forty hours. Um, a month where they need to get outside and that it's uh, something that they've been using for ADHD. So yes, nature deficit, they are with Richard Lou, Megan, that's true. But anyway, so I would say look at other organizations that you normally don't think about and look at those that have been successful. Think about some of the sports, um, uh, the coaches, Coaches have figured out a long time how to get into our communities. When I lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin, 
people always ask me, you know, how did you live in a city like that where there were not a lot of people of color there? There weren't a lot of people of color, but there were some Green Bay Packers there. And those coaches, they were closely with the parents to get their star players and some of those Packers to move to Green Bay. So think about parents as well. The other thing that we're finding, and I'll be done here, we looked at some of the national wildlife refugees that are doing good in this country uh, when it comes to working with communities um, in urban areas. And what they come to realize is that a lot of the mothers in those areas, they have to go home and think about feeding their kids after work so they don't have a lot of time for nighttime um, uh, meetings. Um, and so now they're uh, finding ways to get corporate America to help support uh, contributing uh, lunches, dinners for the uh, mothers so that, and the kids, and also daycare while they're having meetings. And it's been amazing, they said, how they've increased the number of participants in some of their programming because they found out what those needs are. Community needs are so important. When we think about our nature centers and places like that, what is it that we can offer that community other than nature programming? Is this something that they can, uh, workforce planning, uh, workforce webinars or whatever, is it something that we can offer them other than natural resources, but that will also be a win-win for us? Because once they find out about us, they might want to uh, be more in, uh, inclined to join us. That's a long answer, but I've got so much on that subject that I'd like to talk about, Emily. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we got a lot of um, great information and some links to actual folks here on the ground that are doing work. And just as a side note, the Indiana Wildlife Federation is doing a lot of the same work that the National Wildlife Federation is doing in this space, but we can't do it alone. And um, we certainly need more people with, with more backgrounds um, on our board and in our membership. So um, tell your friends and make sure that um, showing up at events like today is a very good first step, but um, getting involved is, is really, really important and making sure that we're creating um, safe spaces and, and uh, making sure that the outdoors um, are, are safe and welcoming for all. So um, thank you for those answers and, um, and for being here for this great presentation that you've given us. Um, I was so excited to pick you up from the airport, Dr. Parker, because I thought by the end of the day, we would probably be fishing, although it's very, very cold here today. So maybe we'll have to do that some other time, but. Do it all the um, time or do some ice fishing. I've had a chance to do that, but Emily, I thank you too. And as I close, I always close with my favorite poem, if that's okay for you. Please. Um, so I, I talked about my late, late, late husband, uh, but I also lost my mother at an early age too, two weeks before I graduated from high school. And uh, it was in her dying that I learned too a lot about living. And so um, I can remember on her dying bed, sitting there and asking her, how in the world can I live without you? And yes, I cried, but crying is like an inside shower. It makes you feel better. Don't you think about a good cry sometimes, you know, but my mama said, when you cry, try not to cry that ugly cry when you're in public. But I was um, crying and I said, mama, how in the world will I be able to live without you? And she said, Mamie, you just have to keep going and growing. And she also said, stay amazing. And I use that in my emails now. And it's in honor of my mother, named my business after my mother, Mark Parker and Associates. But it was on her dying bed when she said, keep going and growing, because she said, you know, this is just the beginning of your life. And so as we talk about making our best better, we have to think about uh, ways in which in this rapidly changing world that we can see these opportunities. And so that poem, which later became a song, is something that I live by and say every day of my life, each day I live, I live to be a day to give the best of me. I'm only one but not alone. Our finest day is yet unknown. Our finest day is yet unknown. Again, on my mother's deathbed, that was what inspired me and keep inspiring me today to keep going and growing and keep smiling. So Emily, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Well, thank you very much. That is a great way to end. Your mama sounded like an amazing person. And I think that all of us are going to be uh, holding on to her words for a while as well. Um, again, let's imagine another warm round of applause for Dr. Parker. Thank you so much. Um, 
as we move on, we're on to our next speaker here. I know that we have um, Jim McCormick scheduled at 1040. I'm not sure if he's around or not to pop in early, but um, before I do that, I wanted to just, of course, you've seen some uh, some links coming into the chat here for our amazing silent auction. We have some great items in our silent auction. We had some very generous donors this year, so make sure that you take this last little bit of time to check out the silent auction. I think we're going to take about a five or 10 minute break here um, while we get Jim queued up. Um, so fill up your coffee and uh, we'll be back. But actually, before I let you guys go, I want to do one more thing. Um, in relation to the silent auction, um, we have Ray Watkins, who is and has been our silent auction chair uh, for the last five years now. So he's done four silent auctions with us. Um, we wanted to take a moment to recognize Ray. Um, the board no uh, nominated and unanimously voted that Ray um, would be the 2021-22 uh, Volunteer of the Year. Um, so I do have some um, gifts here for Ray to say thank you. But we did want to say that um, Ray working on this silent auction, it is a lot of moving parts and he handles it so smoothly and with such a positive attitude. Um, we were doing some calculating and it looks like Ray through the silent auction and through his volunteering has raised over $10,000 for our organization. Um, and I think at the end of today, um, it's probably gonna be closer to 15,000 because our goal is very, very close um, up to put, putting up that up to $15,000. So Ray, thank you so much for your tireless work on our silent auction, making it full of really great um, experiences and uh, books and art, something for everyone over there. So please make sure that you're checking out um, Ray's silent auction. Um, and we are gonna just take a few minutes here. Um, we're gonna put up the, the, the screen here for uh, all of our sponsors. So you guys can check out our sponsors. Uh, let's put up a timer, Derek, if we can, um, and we will come back after everyone gets some refills, and we will be back at, let's say, 1035 uh, for Jim's presentation. We'll see you then.
All right, everybody, welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to get your refills and uh, get your blanket back on your lap. I'm so excited about our next presenter, Jim McCormick. Um, I've been in um, the, the plant world, the, uh, the, the horticulture world for about 15 to 16 years. Been to a lot of native plant conferences. Um, I've seen Jim speak a few times, and again, he's one of those people that when he gives these presentations with his photography, it really just blows you away. He's got a great way of, of, of tying all these really complex um, organisms together, and I'm really excited to have him today, especially on the topic that he's presenting on. Um, Jim has worked for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources for 31 years as a botanist, uh, and then later specializing in wildlife diversity projects, especially those involving birds. He has authored or co-authored six books, uh, including Birds of Ohio and Wild, o Wild Ohio, The Best of Our Natural Heritage. Um, the latter of those won the 2010 Ohio in a Book Award. Uh, he is the co-author of the Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas II book, uh, and he's currently at work on books about dragonflies and moths, which I'm so excited about. Um, Jim writes a column, Nature, for the Columbus Dispatch and regularly publishes a natural history blog. Um, he's written numerous articles on a variety of publications and has delivered hundreds of presentations throughout the eastern United States. He was named 2015 Conservation Communicator of the Year by the Ohio League of uh, Sportsmen. Jim is an avid photographer shooting a range of natural history subjects, uh, which you can check out on his blog, jimmccormick.com, but I am guessing you're about to get a pretty healthy sample right now as we delve into his talk on flora, moths, and birds, a tangled ecological web. Jim, take it away. Thanks, Emily. I trust you can hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. good. I assume everyone else can too. Okay, just bear with me a second. We'll get this thing going. All right. There, how's that? Perfect, looks good, Jim. Okay, thanks. Off we go. Uh, thanks, Emily, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I really wish I was there in person though. I would sort of consider myself an honorary Hoosier, having made many, many trips across the uh, international line between Ohio and your state, uh, including last November, I was just there. Now, if we had been able to do this in person, I would have uh, worked some field work into the trip. This is from November, uh, Jasper Pulaski, the Sandhill Cranes. There's a young one, the middle head in that picture is a juvenile bird. The parents are very good parents and keep their young with them for about a full year. And that's what's going on there. And then I went over to Kankakee Sands, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but if you are not, this is one of the most amazing restoration projects in the Midwest Prairie region by the Nature Conservancy over on the Illinois line. That's sunset at Kankakee, but oh my gosh, they even had a, have a herd of bison established. I think it's 90 some animals. So that is great to see the prairie being put back over in Indiana and I'll be back over there multiple times because it's so cool. But anyway, that's not my talk. <clears throat> my talk is on plants, uh, but more, uh, and it's uh, an unvarnished pitch for native flora, but it's more about what native plants grow. Uh, the insect community that spawns a much more noticeable uh, web of organisms birds. That's going to be the focus here, uh, mostly. So it's really a bird talk. Anyway, that's a gorgeous plant. It's called Glade Mallow Napia Dioica. It's a fairly rare wet prairie species that uh, sparked my own personal interest in Lepidoptera, uh, especially moths. And this dates back about in my early days of collecting. I've collected, uh, I don't know, nine or 10,000 sheets of plants in my career as a botanist. They're all housed in various institutions. This plant was one. I found a new population and I took a specimen back and to the office and was preparing to press it and there was a big green caterpillar on it. This happens when you collect plants, freeloaders come along for the ride and uh, I just had a feeling it was unusual and I saved it, took it to a lepidopterist friend who actually, I think to humor me, he said he can't identify these inchworms as caterpillars all raise it or attempt to. And he did so successfully and it turned out to be Bagasara gulneri, 
uh, No Common Name. And it was only about the second or third record for the thing anywhere. It was the first Ohio record. And that sparked an interest and led to a, you know, pseudo amateur career in Lepidoptera. It's not my main thing, but uh, I love it. And there's David Wagner standing a few years ago in a big patch of the glade mallow I mentioned. And he had never seen the plant, nor had he ever seen the uh, caterpillar I just showed you. Uh, its life, his, life history had not been ferreted out even a few years ago when I showed Dave this population. And within 15 minutes, we'd found 16 of those caterpillars. He took them back to the lab, raised them through the whole life cycle and figured the whole thing out. Dave, though, he's become a really good friend of mine. He wrote uh, the landmark book, if you want to learn about caterpillars. This is what opened people's eyes to this tubular world that's largely out of sight and out of mind, but is unbelievably fascinating. The caterpillars of moths and butterflies, too. Uh, caterpillars of Eastern North America. I highly, highly recommend anyone into nature gets a copy of that book by Dave. Anyway, Indiana. So you have roughly, someone can correct me somewhat on this, I'm sure, but about 1,800 native plant species. Um, you are, you know, the what eastern edge of the great Midwestern prairie region. But of all those native plant species, all of them undoubtedly host Lepidopter and larvae. And by that, I mean caterpillars of moths or to a far lesser extent butterflies. I'll tell you why. Um, <clears throat> The caterpillars are our biggest group of herbivores by far. I'll show you a dramatic slide demonstrating that in a bit, uh, but way more than even white-tailed deer, little known fact, uh, and, and essential to the food chain. Oh, I mean, unbelievably essential, and I'll hope to get that out here throughout the course of this talk. So even beautiful wildflowers that right now we're all so looking forward to seeing. I mean, it's a beautiful day here, blue skies, but it's eight degrees. There's no wildflowers out there now, but they will erupt as they always do here in a few months, like fire pink. Uh, it would have its own little suite of caterpillars special to that plant, as would common blue eye grass, one of our prettiest little irises starting to bloom in late spring. And even our state over here in Ohio, our state wildflower, the large flowered trillium, it has caterpillars. Everything does. Some of them are so small, they just live with inside the leaf tissue, little borers, and you, you wouldn't ever see them, but they are there, and someone is eating them. Ferns, even the uh, pteridophytes, the ferns, of which Indiana probably has something close to 100 species, have their little complement of caterpillars, specialists usually, two ferns. This is a crested wood fern with, you can see some of the penny, the little leaflets, they're called penny, uh, have been eaten away at the top, and uh, it was very likely uh, the caterpillar, the gold spotted ghost moth did that. That's a specialist of ferns, but there are others. Water plants have caterpillars. This is our, in my opinion, the most beautiful of our native water lilies, the fragrant water lily, Nymphia odorata. And it's got its little suite of caterpillars. Here's the water lily borer moth. They're easy to find. They sit on the lily pads during the day. Their caterpillars eat the inner tissues of the uh, stems of the flowers, the pedicels of the flowers, often under the water, but within the stem. So high specialization. This is just pervasive throughout the world of botany. Uh, but when you get into the woody plants, uh, this is where the real heavy lifting starts to occur in terms of caterpillar production. Uh, species like honey locusts, have, this has many specialists, uh, produce a lot more caterpillars than the wildflowers and water plants that I just showed you. That's, uh, by the way, some of you might know him. That's Daniel Boone. That's really his name, Cincinnati botanist, uh, and one of our best botanists here. But Dan is leaning up against an old growth honey locust, one of the bigger ones I've ever seen in a floodplain. But honey locusts spawn some really, really cool things uh, that are very noticeable if you're lucky enough to find them. This is the honey locust moth caterpillar, a specialist on that species, and it would win a larval beauty pop pageant. It's just incredible, about the size of your thumb, or pinky at least. Uh, oaks win, we all, well, I shouldn't say we all know that. I don't know if we all do or not, but if you've read Doug Tallamy's work, Doug's a good friend of mine and a mentor, uh, you would know that oaks uh, are the champions in terms of just sheer caterpillar biomass production and diversity of species. Uh, 
species like this bur oak, just uh, overwhelming number of caterpillars, some of which are absolutely incredible. I could give a whole slideshow on all the <laughs> bizarre larvae spawned off oaks. Here's just one example, the white blotch heterocampa uh, that just is otherworldly looking. It's a fairly big size caterpillar too. <clears throat> When you get into the softer wooded hardwoods, uh, softer wooded trees, I should say, not, um, like maples, the diversity starts to lessen, but not a lot. Uh, maples still produce, you know, 150 or something like that species of caterpillars here in our part of the world, uh, like the sugar maple that's seen there in flower. This is one of the uh, more beautiful uh, specialist sun maple, the green stripe maple worm. It's not hard to find if you get out there and look. I should caveat that though, that all caterpillars are, are a little tough to find. I'll talk about why that is and some ways to find them. But anyway, the green straight maple worm is a classic maple specialist, but look what it becomes. It's almost hard to believe when it becomes a moth. The rosy maple moth, it looks like a little Lepidopteran teletubby, pink and yellow. I mean, what a bizarre color combination that you normally would not see in nature. Um, and I should add here too, that it's usually the opposite. Usually it's a reverse ugly duckling tail where the caterpillar looks way cooler and more beautiful than the adult that it becomes, but not here. I mean, the caterpillar looks great, but look at that thing. This is a gateway moth, um, like a gateway drug. You should you can compare it to for people to get them interested in moths. When they see one of those, which is a very common moth, um, they want to learn more. So you'd say, well, why would it be pink and yellow? Probably because of that. The first brood of rosy maple moths emerge in perfect synchronicity with the um, ripening of the uh, maple, especially the red maple samaras or fruit, and they are pink and yellow, and the moths will get on them and perch like that. And then good luck seeing that pink and yellow thing, where any other substrate, you easily see it. I, a word about butterflies. I don't want to ignore butterflies. I love butterflies. I'm sure far more people like them and know about them than moths, but uh, it is an absolute smidgen of the diversity of moths. It cannot be understated how much fewer there are. So Indiana, if you look at Jeff Belt's book, he lists 149 Butterflies for the state of Indiana, of course, that would include major rarities. You know, if you really, I, I'm going to guess if you worked hard and explored Indiana over a summer, you could probably find, you know, half that maybe. So we're talking 75 to 100 species, you know, that you might be able to find with some work every year. <clears throat> now, not to dismiss them, like the tiger swallowtail is a gorgeous butterfly, the ones I just showed you on Joe Pie. Uh, and their caterpillars are amazing too. It's a tree snake mimic, a little snake mimic, um, eating mostly tulip tree and black cherry and ash. Of course, we all know what's happening to ash, um, but they, they uh, are a big caterpillar, thumb size, and they have those fake eye spots. Those are not real eyes at all. They're just pigment patches, creates the illusion of a tree snake, which to a small bird that especially winters in the neotropics, that could be very intimidating because they probably would know what a tree snake is. Um, and the evolutionary origins of, of this group of papillionid swallowtails is tropical. So there's this long-term you know, interrelationship with birds here and that's probably what evolved that look of the caterpillar. Well, Maz utterly blow that out of the water. Um, here in Ohio, and I'm gonna, it will be very similar with Indiana. No one really knows how many moths we have. We know that over 2,000 species have been documented. Uh, a lot of the micro lepidoptera specialists, the people who specialize in the really, really tiny understudied ones, they say you could possibly double that if you could find all the micro lepidoptera. Now, all these moths are producing caterpillars, and that's the gist of my story here today, but um, there are just inestimably more caterpillars than what butterflies are producing here. And I hate comparing, it's not even fair at all to do this, but you could make the case that therefore the moths are um, far more significant ecologically, just in terms of the sheer food that they're producing. <clears throat> well, this is how they produce. This is just a, a, a 
Biology 101 lesson on Lepidopter here real quick to refresh us all on this, but moths uh, typically carpet bomb reproduce. That's my term for it anyway. They lay a lot of eggs. This is a salt marsh moth with hundreds. I counted those, believe it or not, once, and I don't remember how many it is, but it was like 700 eggs. Some female moths in their short lifespan will dump thousands of eggs. Anytime you see that sort of fecundity or re high reproduction rate, you can be assured the predation level is astronomical. That's why they're doing that. They've got to get you know, uh, that many eggs out there to get a few of them through the predatorial gauntlet. So we'll jump to a bigger species to see this beautiful metamorphosis, this perfect metamorphosis or four-part life cycle of a moth or a butterfly. Uh, using a larger species, it's easier to see. These are hickory horn double eggs. <clears throat> That's the name of the caterpillar. The moth is the regal moth, a uh, royal walnut moth, but uh, here they are in the process of hatching. The dark ones, that's the little caterpillar coiled up and they're ready to burst out. You can see an egg where one's eaten its way out. And then minutes later, this is what they look like. You would not tell that was a caterpillar with your naked eye. It's too small. We're talking a few millimeters in length here, but it's already got the shape going on. Uh, and that's how a caterpillar begins life. Well, they grow like little weeds. All caterpillars do is eat and then poop. And the poop is plant, dry plant material and pellets called frass, F-R-A-S-S. -S. Uh, so this is the third instar. Each growth phase between molts, that's how they grow is by molting, is called an instar. And most caterpillars have five, some have seven or eight, but five's probably the average number, at least for these bigger species. So here's a third instar. At this point, it's big enough you would easily notice it. And during the day, when it's inactive, it lays on the surface of a leaf in plain sight. And that, we think, is to mimic uh, walnut, uh, walnut flowers that have fallen off the tree and often land on the leaf. And they look like that, caterpillar, walnut. <clears throat> Uh, walnut being a major host of this species. Um, and a lot of caterpillars do take on strange forms that mimic the appearance of other things to try and avoid uh, predation. Well, by the time it hits its penultimate instar, that's the next to last instar, you will not miss this thing if you're lucky enough to see it, the hickory horn devil. This I saw from my car moving, still moving. Uh, in a hickory tree in this case, um, but it gets even better. He's going to move one more time and then it comes out like that. Now we're talking elephantine proportions. It's the size of a hot dog, literally. You could fill a hot dog bun with this. Uh, horrifying looking thing. If you didn't know what it is, they don't sting or do anything bad. They can't hurt you in any way. It's the shock and awe met method of predator avoidance, at least with birds. It's so intimidating, any self-respecting chickadee or warbler would flee if it saw this. Uh, you can hear it eating the, uh, in this case, walnut foliage uh, five or 10 feet away. You can hear the crunching of the mandibles. It's truly, truly impressive at that point. Uh, tens of thousands of times more in biomass than that little one I showed you at the very beginning. And then if it's lucky and it makes it, um, it becomes this gorgeous, huge moth. It's the size of a bat, a decent sized bat, the regal walnut moth or regal moth, uh, one of our uh, silk moths. Now I should put in a word about moths. 99% um, is the generally stated mortality rate in, in this world of moths and probably butterflies too. So don't come back is a moth if you choose to be reincarnated. Your, your odds are not very good that you'll ever even make it to the adult uh, part of the life cycle. And most don't. But those that do, they go on to do different services that would be a whole nother talk, like pollination and feeding other things. I will put in a word, though, for these larger moths like this one, because they are the primary food of bats. And as you know, a lot of our bats aren't doing so well, white nose syndrome especially. Uh, here's an eastern red bat hanging in beech leaves. It's one of our migratory species. They're doing, doing pretty well. But the major food group of bats in Indiana are moths, probably followed by beetles after that. So it's really important to grow the moths up so they can feed our bats. But roughly, you can, you can divide these moths, very generally at least, into these two groups, generalists versus, versus specialists. And, it probably tilts way more towards specialization. 
uh, than it does generalism. Well, here's a generalist though, uh, one of our prettiest moths too. It's an IO moth. Uh, when, when startled by a bird, they flick those four wings open and re reveal these big scary eyes. And that's been shown to spook birds, you know, it's like some monster opened its eyes and they, they don't want any part of it and will we'll flee sometimes at least. So that's an IO moth, very common silk moth, uh, really beautiful caterpillar too. Uh, it does sting. I've brushed them and they'll let you know right away that they have uh, uh, venomous spines all over them. So it's generally a spiny caterpillar. It's best untouched unless you know exactly what it is and what it does. Uh, I would point out too that this caterpillar, which is polyphagous, that just means it eats many, many species of plants. This has even been documented eating corn in fields, hundreds of host plants. They're called host plants, whatever a caterpillar has to feed on. But if you look really carefully on the left end of that caterpillar, you'll see two little insects. Those are parasitic wasps, parasitoid wasps, actually. And this is an enormous fate for many, many caterpillars. Uh, parasitoid flies and wasps that lay their eggs on or in them, and the larvae eat the caterpillar alive. Horrible fate, uh, but very, very common in this world. So it isn't just birds that get them. Anyway, here, here's a plant that has one of the coolest specialist caterpillars in Eastern North America, in my opinion. Uh, we, we, many of us will know greenbrier. It's prickly oftentimes, especially the woody ones. It's not fun to walk through in the woodland understory. There's about 10 species in Indiana and probably uh, something like half of them, six maybe are the woody ones that are brambly. And this is one of those, the sawbriar, smilax, glauca, a gorgeous plant. I will give them their due. New, no nursery will ever sell this. Uh, but if it didn't have spines, they might be tempted to. Look at the, that's in fall with the autumnal foliage and the beautiful blue berries. But there is a holy grail caterpillar that only eats smilax. This is extreme specialization. It's so common in this world. And this is it. I finally caught up with this two years ago. I've been looking for them for years. The moth is not particularly rare, but it's so hard to find the caterpillar. On your left is a dead leaf withered and uh, on the vine still. That's really common how the leaves uh, fold around and stay stuck to the vine after they die. And the caterpillar is a, a brilliant mimic of that. That's the caterpillar on the right. And it's a big caterpillar. It's not small or anything. It's just from afar, it looks so much like a dead leaf, forget about it. <clears throat> Here's one in isolation so you can see it better. When I slightly puffed air onto it, it actually started to slowly spin both ways, just like a dead leaf in the breeze does. Remarkable camouflage. That's for visual predators. That's probably a bird defense. But this, this caterpillar, and there's the uh, uh, rather plain Jane by comparison moth in the inset, um, they uh, only eat that one genus of plants. Very, very common specialization. This is why protection, one of many reasons, conservation of all of our biodiversity is so important if you wanna protect everything. Anyway, better living through chemistry. So plants are infused with all manner of compounds, so many of which we make use of. Some of those we've synthesized now and they don't come straight from the tap, but they did originally. There's just at the bottom, you can read that for yourself. There's a few examples of some of these chemical compounds and common plants around us. Um, <clears throat> but uh, these have evolved mostly to thwart herbivory. Plants don't wanna be eaten and this is how they fight back better living through chemistry. They produce toxic compounds that are in, uh, in I'm impalatable to the organisms that might want to eat them. And this is mostly caterpillars. That's probably the main source of this evolution. And so plants and lepidopteran larvae have this really enormous long co-evolutionary histories. That's why they're so tightly wedded to each other. So something like this, which you know well in your state, it's one of our worst invasives, the amur honeysuckle, and there's several other Lanistra. Eurasian species that are equally bad. That's what the spring understory looks like in many areas now in the uh, big picture. Uh, but there's no chemical connection to our native lepidopterans with this and very, very few species will eat that plant. So you end up with these large biological dead zones. It's one of the real scourges of non-native flora 
not just overtaking and physically choking out native stuff. It's this, this chemical connection to the animals that have to eat native plants because that's the only chemicals they can process. Um, but as an aside or another footnote, I would just say that people, this, this benefits us too, because people benefit greatly from this warfare between plants and larvae. Uh, because we've made such great use out of those, uh, those compounds. Here's, those are four major classes of phytochemicals. And you can, I guarantee you a lot of you drank coffee this morning, probably still are. And there you go, caffeine. It's not one of our native plants, but it's there to ward off caterpillar or bivory, as are those other things. So this has uh, huge, huge ties to the human condition. All right, not, none of that's very well known, but it should be. Well, as I mentioned before, moths, should they make it to that phase, that lucky 1% or so, uh, they become important pollinators as well. So moths do serve a purpose beyond the larvae. I'm gonna mostly talk about the larvae, uh, but this is a gorgeous zebra conchalotes on um, Culver's root in a garden. Uh, by the way, she, uh, Emily kindly mentioned those books of mine. I have one in press right now. It'll be out um, hopefully this summer and it's called Gardening for Moths, which sounds utterly bizarre. And I'm amazed I convinced a publisher to do this, but it's gonna be very cool and it covers the whole Midwest, including all of Indiana. Um, and it's, it's all about uh, what I'm talking about in this talk, but then, then specific ways to use beautiful native flora to attract beautiful moths like that. Well, here's one of the rarest plants in Indiana and uh, in the entire Midwest, the federally threatened prairie white fringe orchid, a stunning large several foot tall orchid. And orchids are notorious for moth pollination. Uh, it's a huge part of that. If you look closely at the base of those flowers, you'll see a long pale white green spike sticking down from them. That's the, uh, the uh, nectar spur. And clear at the base of that is where the nectar is. So to tap into that and we're a pollinator, you have to have a really long tongue to access that. And that's moths that can hover in front of the flower. So I knew that uh, sphinx moths were alleged to be the main pollinator of this really rare plant, but I wanted to see for myself. So I parked myself one night in, in a colony of, of this plant in Ohio which what seemed like a fool's errand at the time. Nothing was going on. I'm getting eaten by mosquitoes and it's getting dark and I'm all set up with my lens and all of a sudden like a wraith, like a ghost out of the dimness in flew this big sphinx moth right to my plant and went around and hit about every flower on it. But what's really cool is what that moth is. A lot of you know it if you grow tomatoes, the tobacco hornworm, which a lot of people call tomato hornworms. That's what some of you have killed because they're eating your tomato plants, but it's a native moth. It is a specialist on nightshades uh, as a caterpillar and, and your tomatoes are nightshades. So it jumps ship. We should you know, give it credit for being opportunistic to do that, but they still eat native nightshades out in the wild like, like where I was. And that's the moth that came in to work this rare orchid and enable its survival. So there's a lot of connectivity out there that may seem to be unrelated, but is really important. Here's this one more cool little orchid example of this. This is a colony of, in a swamp forest of tubercled rain orchid. It's a small, much more inconspicuous orchid. Uh, and more common than the one that we just saw, but equally beautiful. You can see the inset. It's got these, just these cool little orchid flowers in these racemes like that. And I was showing my co-author actually in my moth book, this colony once, and we were looking around, you know, this is cool. We weren't really looking for moths or anything. And all of a sudden we noticed moths, moths by the dozen. This is in very early morning. And there they were, the little great plume moth. These are the size of mosquitoes. That's what you could be forgiven for mistaking it for when it flew by. And literally a hundred or more little great plume moths were working over this colony of orchid, pollinating, providing the pollination services for it, as moths do. This also has these long nectar spurs. Now I would put a note about the great plume moth that it is a specialist on grapes. You know, there's about nine native grapes in Indiana, plus the creepers, Virginia creeper, and, and another one. 
and that's what this group of Maz is wholly wedded to. Grapes get a bad rap. Uh, foresters, some I will say, will tell you, oh, these are bad, you know, get rid of these grapes, they're horrible. That is really not good advice. They are native uh, and they do a lot of heavy lifting. They produce so many cool organisms, including moss, it's, it's, it's can't be understated, including this orchid pollinator right here. All right, so anyway, when we get into caterpillars, what we see with what I just showed you, the moths and the butterflies, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's because so few make it to that stage, that one or 2% or whatever. Uh, out of sight and out of mind are the caterpillars. The real biomass in this life cycle of these lepidopterans. Um, and this is about the best chart I've ever seen to do this. This comes from the uh, Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada. That's the Carolinian forest, the northern limits of the deciduous forest that we have here. So this probably holds true here as well, but this is the comparative biomass of animals in a forest. Caterpillar overwhelmingly dominating. And you can see the amphibians are big too. If you look really close down in the bottom by the mouse, um, notice how big the chipmunk is too. Uh, anyway, by the mouse is a moose up there. Uh, we'll substitute two white-tailed deer for that. 600 and 700,000 or so in Ohio, you probably have half a million or so over there. That's a lot of mammal. But look at the size scale. If you could get all those Indiana caterpillars in late summer and stick them in a huge pile, uh, pile up all your deer next to it, <clears throat> there'd be your size scale. Any sort of predation level of that scope and scale is going to have enormous long-term influences on the natural world, including birds. And that's what I'm going to go into. Uh, so caterpillars really make things go around. We need to manage native plants for them since they're virtually all utterly wedded to native plants. Uh, huge mortality rates because of all those predators, uh, but they really actively drive evolution as plants evolve chemicals constantly to try and thwart them. Some caterpillar species always crack the chemical code, get in there and eat them, but most are excluded. Um, and then this fascinating bird evolution stuff that goes on with them. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, absolutely critical to songbirds, especially. That's what I'll, I'll really focus in on here. But I do want to say that as a photographer and lover of nature, they are just stunning. Once we, I, we've, we've shown many photographers caterpillars for their first time, me and my friends. And oh my God, they just get just hooked on it. And how could you not with something like that? That's the black spotted prominent moth, a specialist on peas. This one was on a uh, black locust, but that's like a Salvador Dali surrealist painting come to life. And it's not rare. Most of the things I'm gonna show you are not rare. This is not rare. That's a monkey slug. Uh, best theory I've heard about the bizarre appearance is it's a shed tarantula skin mimic. You. You go, why? We don't have tarantulas up here. Yeah, but the birds that eat eat them up here, winter in the neotropics where tarantulas are very common, they would know what that is. And apparently nothing wants to eat a shed tarantula skin, even a bird. So if you look like it, some measure of protection. Uh, another bizarre one that looks like a sea slug or something, and they are called slugs, the crown slug. This is a small group of moths who the caterpillars are just otherworldly looking. This is a um, uh, polyphagous species that eats many things. It's near where you live if it isn't in your yard. This is an extreme specialist, a pawpaw sphinx, only eats pawpaw and a uh, uh, stunning, stunning creature by any estimation. Stinging rose caterpillar, a bit more of a polyphagous or many eating, many plant eating species here, but look at that. That truly does look like a sea slug. Well named, uh, it will sting you. Again, anytime a caterpillar is heavily armed like that, you really don't want to touch it unless you know exactly what it'll do to you. And this is one of our larger caterpillars, the Cecropia moth caterpillar, which just looks like something a, a, a crazed artist would come up with, but it's real uh, and it's big. It's bigger than your thumb. And Fittingly, it becomes a really, really big moth. Um, our, of, of our native regularly occurring moths, that's the biggest one, the Cecropia moth. Uh, stunning. You know, all that work, weeks and weeks eating plants as a caterpillar, 
to become that moth, which is to be crude, essentially a flying gonad. It has no functional mouth parts. It does not feed. And an old one would be one week old. It lives just to find a mate, reproduce, and if it's a female, dump the eggs and it's done. Well, again, I don't want to shortchange butterflies. People get mad at me, these beautiful butterflies, and they do a lot of pollination services and other things too, those that make it to the adult. That's a spice bush swallowtail, very, very common around here. Uh, and it was not that long ago learned that they are the main uh, pollinator, if not the only one for our native azaleas, like this pinkster flower. And I caught them in the act doing that. that Pinkster flowers swarming with spice bush swallowtails, and it, many other things too. Uh, I'm a big fan of this butterfly. That the it, from clockwise here, upper left, that's a yellow fringed orchid, a very rare plant over your way and here, uh, and it seems to be the main pollinator of that. Cardinal flower on the right, and then the, one of the prettiest phlox, the smooth phlox, phlox glabarima. Uh, they're big pollinators of that. If you can ever find smooth phlox in cultivation, get it grow it in your garden. It's absolutely stunning. But it's got a cool caterpillar too, and it's another snake. It, it, this might be the king of the snake mimics of caterpillars um, with those big fake eye spots. And if a bird taps at this, it will lunge and flail its head around violently and uh, stick little orange horns out of its head called osmeteria that exude foul chemicals and Hopefully that drives the bird away because caterpillars do not want to get eaten by birds. And they, I'm going to just share a little aside on some of the interesting poise that are, are bird evolved, no doubt, to thwart uh, bird predation. This is a really common, mostly oak specialist, not, not completely, but mostly oaks, the white dotted prominent moth caterpillar. It's pretty cool looking, decent sized thing, you know, your pinky size maybe. But when a bird like a warbler comes up and, and investigates this, taps at it maybe, it does this. It rears up like the cobra coming out of the guy's basket and starts swaying its head back and forth, bears its mandibles together to create this, you know, little pseudo face uh, and look scary, I guess. And if you were in the shoes of a chickadee, it might be enough to back you off. If you keep pushing it, it does this. It actually coils up like a snake and throws its head over the loop and stares at you. This is, in my opinion, very clearly bird evolved defenses, uh, you know, against visual predators. This one takes it even farther. That's a walnut sp uh, sphinx, almost as specialized on walnut. It eats a few other tree species. Uh, and it is a sound making caterpillar. So if it is harassed by a bird, <clears throat> its first tactic is it falls to the ground and starts flailing violently, shaking itself around and hissing. It hisses so loud by forcing airs out of its little air holes called spiracles along its side that standing upright, you can hear the hissing on the ground below you. It's really intimidating at first when you don't know what it is. That's to ward off bird predation. I mentioned those little parasitoid wasps and flies too. Well, they have, caterpillars have tactics to deal with those. This is one of our bizarrest caterpillars, the Harris's three-spot moth. And as it molts and sheds, somehow it retains its old head capsules on the seti or the long hairs that are sticky. The head capsules are like little football helmets. Here they are up close. And what happens, and you can test it with a pencil tip, if you touch, if a little insect lands on that caterpillar, instantly it whacks them with the head capsules and knocks them off. And that's the evolution of that. Here's another way that um, caterpillars go about dealing with insects, flails. So this is a gray furcula, which is a specialist on members of the um, cottonwood family, aspens, cottonwoods, willows, populaceae, or I mean salicaceae, that family of plants. But, uh, the anal prolegs are modified into long whips, and when an insect lands on that to try and lay eggs, it gets whipped instantly and knocked off. So uh, they have all manner of tactics, active tactics like this, to try and keep things from, from eating them. It doesn't work too well, obviously. But the biggest way by far is crypsis, camouflage, crypsis. This is a great example. It's a little sphinx moth caterpillar, small-eyed sphinx moth hanging on ironwood in autumn. And even the, the dappled tissue uh, patches on the caterpillar look like necrotic tissue on the aging leaves. And 
so so hard to see these things even when you're close to them and presumably birds as well have trouble here's an elm specialist only eats elm the almus that genus the double tooth prominent cater, uh, moth caterpillar it's like a stegosaurus in the back of the caterpillar and it always eats in from the edge become de facto serrations on the margin of the leaf. And again, it's a big caterpillar, but really, really hard to see from any distance. A more common one is the checkered fringe prominent here on black maple, but it'll eat a variety of tree leaf species and it becomes one with the leaf. Always eats in from the edge and the caterpillar becomes the edge of the leaf. Insanely hard to see these things, even when you're five or 10 feet away. Uh, the camouflage is so effective. But perhaps no one takes the cake like this. This is a camouflaged looper, an amazingly abundant moth caterpillar. Uh, typically eats members of the sunflower family, like this blazing star, but it decorates its body with um, plant bits, usually bits of the flower that it's eating. So there's a caterpillar circled. The bottom end is the end of the caterpillar. The upper end is the head of the caterpillar. There it is stretched out and, and I'd add quite beautifully decorated with bits of uh, liatris flowers. And uh, obviously a pretty hard thing to see. <clears throat> but the inchworms are king. In this world, inchworms, we've probably all seen an inchworm at some point. They lack the four medial prolegs or the four sets of legs in the middle that allow caterpillars to glide along so neatly. So these have to do that looping gait as they move because they only have legs on either end. And inchworms, this is the family Geometridae, they are enormously abundant. I suppose our most abundant group of moth caterpillars are moths. Uh, they're everywhere and they are harmless. They generally don't have foul chemicals or spines or anything like that. They just totally depend on crypsis camouflage to become one with the plant, like this one is doing on a, a maple twig, I think it was. Well, the predation pressures are intense and that's what drives all the things that I just showed, the tactics I just showed you. Uh, and a lot of the predators, especially the birds are diurnal. Uh, so the caterpillars emerge under cover of darkness, the little glowing slug moth caterpillar, uh, that's under UV light or black light. That's one way we really up our odds of finding these at night. Most of the pictures I'm showing you cats were taken at night. That's when we go out to find them uh, and no glow. Uh, quite brightly, many of them under UV black light. That was just something that was figured out not all that long ago. And uh, this, but anyway, the nocturnal habits are to avoid these diurnal predators, undoubtedly birds being a huge part of that. And birds do eat a lot of caterpillars. This is a 440,000 red-eyed vireos seasonally colonize the state of Indiana every year in your deciduous forests. <clears throat> and this is the Freddy Krueger of, of, of the bird world to a caterpillar. Vireos um, are highly specialized on, on caterpillar feeding. This one here, actually how it's got that cocked up head um, profile that's it was looking under leaves they do it all the time if you watch them they they all vireos they cock their head to the side because they know that most caterpillars hide under the leaf during the day not on the top and they're getting under the leaves and looking up at them to find them but a very conservative estimate of just this one species uh, on a long late summer day in the state of indiana 13 million caterpillars collectively, all those red-eyed vireos. That's undoubtedly extremely conservative too. Um, this gives you uh, the scope and scale of how many caterpillars are out there. If you go to a place like, this is the Charles Dean Wilderness Area in Southern Indiana, um, a scene like that in late summer, especially like late August, early September, when the caterpillar crops at their peak, uh, you, you couldn't even begin to estimate how many billions of caterpillars are in that photo. That's why forests are so productive to uh, songbird production. You can gauge the health of a forest by sticking a moth sheet out. This is a way we attract the adults. Um, you, uh, mercury vapor light like that is best. And uh, in they come, uh, moth to a flame. If you put a sheet up in a really urbanized area like a park in downtown Indianapolis, you won't get much. 
because the habitat's not healthy around it. There's not a lot of native flora. If you do the same setup in a place like the edge of Appalachia Preserve in Southern Ohio, where this was, uh, the moth numbers and diversity can be utterly staggering. And it's speaking to the health of the overall environment around them, all those native flora, a lack of pollution, a lack of light pollution, which kills a, a lot of moths, that sort of thing. So moths are wonderful gauges of uh, environmental health. So in Indiana, um, you, you some a birder could correct me on this. I kind of guesstimated, but something like 415 species. And the, the meat of it for this talk is the last two points where uh, about half of the 90 species that depend on wooded habitats are utterly caterpillar dependent, highly caterpillar dependent. But all of them, all of the breeding birds, the songbirds at least, and cuckoos and a few others uh, are eating a lot of caterpillars, all right? But some are really, really dependent, you know, <clears throat> half of your breeding songbirds on caterpillars. And there's, there's this gorgeous, elegant, really, migratory synchronicity with birds and caterpillars. Um, come, come the flowering of the oaks in really, really early spring, there's this initial flush or crop of caterpillars where the inchworms and others hat that overwintered as eggs, they start to hatch out, move around and become active. And some caterpillars overwintered as caterpillars and they become more active. Um, and in essence, in early spring, the caterpillar crop starts and it becomes available to birds. One of our earliest migrants is the golden crown kinglet and ruby crown kinglets. And their, their timing that migration to coincide with this early blush of caterpillars. Uh, as a footnote, the kinglet, this kinglet overwinters too. And they do so by um, almost exclusively eating caterpillars. They're, little inchworms that uh, freeze and thaw and overwinter on twigs as, as caterpillars. And they, they are good at finding those. But anyway, as the spring progresses and moves on, other caterpillars attain more and more size as they feed and move through their molts and instar stages and become pretty hefty, pretty quick. Some of them, this is a red wash prominent on a, a red bud. Red bud, by the way, is great for caterpillars. and and by that time, the later migrants start to appear, like this yellow-billed cuckoo. Cuckoos are caterpillar specialists to the nth degree, both black-billed and yellow-billed. But they're big birds, bigger than robins. So they don't want to come back when there's just dinky little inchworms to feed. They wait till that caterpillar crop gets some size and uh, biomass to it, like the cat I just showed you. And that's when they appear. They're still arriving into you know, late June, or I mean mid-June, early June. Uh, as the caterpillars mature for them to feed on. I would also use the cuckoos in ex as an example of, you know, these are by no means Indiana's birds, Ohio's birds. These are birds of the America. These are the neotropical migrants, like so many birds I'll talk about here at the end, um, where they, they, it's just the seasonal colonization from the tropics into the North country to uh, feast on this seasonal production of caterpillars. And then once it cools down, they leave. Caterpillars disappear, the birds go back. In the case of these two cuckoos, all the way into South America, uh, where they submerge into the uh, slopes of the Andes or the uh, Amazonian basin, where very little is known about them, but they're undoubtedly eating caterpillars down there too. Birds that you might not even think of as eating caterpillars, big seed crackers, you know, seed cracking bills like this rose-breasted grosbeak heavily eat caterpillars, especially when there are nestlings in the nest. Uh, sparrows eat a lot of caterpillars. I'll show you at the very last slide an example of that, but this Vesper sparrow will grab caterpillars galore when uh, she, he has to or she has to feed nestlings because they're wonderfully assimilated little bags of protein, perfect for a growing nestling. See a lot of different behavior with birds based on how they go about caterpillaring. This is a pine warbler, a, a well-named warbler for a change that um, is wholly dependent on pines. But pines have their own host of specialist moth caterpillars like this black-eyed zowie, and they are pine needle mimics. Decent sized caterpillars, insanely hard to spot because they look just like the pine needles. But that's probably why uh, pine warblers are slow, methodical 
feeders that creep carefully through the pine needles. If they raged around like some of the other warblers, they wouldn't even, they'd miss these things probably. So when we just talk about warblers and there are 38 warbler species that breed in the Eastern, Eastern North America, uh, probably 24, 25 in Indiana, uh, but almost all of them migrate through your state uh, in some numbers. But these are truly birds of the world. This is one of the greatest seasonal occupations of an animal in the, uh, uh, North America, north of Mexico, uh, our part of the world, the Eastern deciduous forest primarily and the boreal forest to our north where all these 38 species of warblers uh, move north uh, largely to capitalize on the production of our caterpillars. Uh, once their breeding is over and it cools down, the caterpillars disappeared, back they retreat to their, really their ancestral lands, the tropics, especially middle America. This includes all these little gems that we all know and love, like the common yellow throat, chestnut sided warbler with emerging oak foliage, uh, both heavy, Caterpillar eaters, the, the rapidly declining golden winged warbler uh, specializes on small caterpillars that hide in leaves, rolled up leaves. Look at that little needle like bill that it uses to pry those out. One of the prettiest warblers, Geothlipus formosa. Formosa means beautiful um, in Latin, the Kentucky warbler. Uh, Caterpillar specialist, morning warbler, a coveted bird in our part of the world, a uh, caterpillar specialist. Nashville warbler, uh, like the golden winged warbler, specializes on small caterpillars that often hide in leaf clusters. Here's one extracting one in that picture. Here's our smallest Eastern warbler, the Northern Perula, uh, flying off in early spring, mid-April, having just arrived in Southern Ohio with a little inchworm caterpillar that just emerged. And that's mostly what it's feeding on then. This is one of the worst named warblers because it was named at a time of great lepidopter and ignorance, all right? So any tubular bag of goo was a worm. Uh, so they named it the worm-eating warbler. Correctly named, it would be the caterpillar-eating warbler. And worm-eating warblers eat lots of caterpillars. Um, this is so profound. I could go on and on about that, and I'm not going to do that, but it is so profound, the influence of lepidopteran larvae on bird populations that we, our forests literally would fall silent if somehow all those caterpillars disappeared overnight. They're such a staple food source. Uh, and not just for birds either, but that's what we're talking about here. So things like that yellow-throated warbler, which is a specialist of uh, sycamore trees, but there's a whole legion of caterpillars that are uh, sycamore specialists. So it's got kind of a lock on those things. Uh, and then this rapidly declining cerulean warbler to the left. Um, no caterpillars? We don't have those beauties. So here's the whole talk, right? In one slide, basically, without pictures to jazz it up. And you can see that for yourselves. We're managing for native flora. I don't care if it's a wildlife agency or a, a nature preserve commission, it makes no difference. If, we, you know, if we're managing wild spaces for biodiversity, which hopefully most of us wanna do, we're managing for native flora. The war against non-native flora cannot be understated. Uh, because native flora grows insects that are songbirds and, and many other animals depend upon. Well, I'm going to end with one last note on this whole thing to tie people more into it, because it seems if we don't tie ourselves into something, it doesn't get any traction, for better or worse. But um, birds are a huge economic driver. That can't be understated, too. Many of you have been here. This is the boardwalk at McGee Marsh in northwest Ohio on Lake Erie. And here's a whole bunch of birders uh, in spring and probably looking at warblers. That's what everyone wants to see. That's why I focused on them here in this talk is, you know, like people provide lists, day lists of what they saw up there. And they'll say, oh, we had 130 species, but here's all the warblers. And they'll list all those out separately. People love warblers. And they're probably looking at some in that picture. But there are a lot of those people, not just at McGee Marsh. This is from the Federales, their last uh, survey of outdoor users. Um, and they estimated 86 million wildlife watchers. All right, now this is mostly birders. It covers a lot of bases too. 
they say 45 million people are birders, but however way you shake it and quibble about those stat numbers, yeah, there are a lot of birders out there. In my state, it's over a million and a half by self-definition. Uh, but here's the bottom line for a politician, someone like that, is what they spend. The last two bullet points there. Uh, they are spending, these bird watchers, like at McGee or in, at uh, Jasper Pulaski, um, over twice Coca-Cola's worldwide gross receipts in a year. Gosh, could you imagine if all of us got together as a unified uh, group on one page speaking, you know, as one voice, the, uh, the power that we would have politically? Um, kind of like herding cats there. I mean, we can hope though, but uh, the bottom line, there's a lot of raw material out there of conservationists to work with. There you go, that's it. I hope I made my case that caterpillars are more than just bags of goo. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jim. I try not to talk too loudly after Jim speaks because I know everyone's brains are just full of new information. I try not to move suddenly. Um, my mind was blown about 49 times during that. Um, so thank you so much. I always really enjoy um, your photography. It's so incredible. We did have a couple of questions come in. Um, one is, are there any specialists on ash trees that will be threatened by the decline of ash populations? Uh, great question. Fantastic question. Yes, in a nutshell. David Wagner, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, he and co-authors produced a wonderful uh, peer-reviewed paper documenting that. And it's, it's well into the triple figures of specialists. And this doesn't count all the little stuff. So in the moth world, just to keep it to what I talked about, there are a whole legion of specialists on ash trees. Uh, fortunately, uh, most of them have been able to jump ship a little bit. There's one, I'll just throw one example out. It's called the ash, uh, uh, the fawn sphinx, and it's a big sphinx moth. But fawn sphinx primarily eat um, ash, but they will also eat a few other things like cherry. So that's probably their only saving grace. They're gonna suffer, but they might not disappear. But Dave's paper lists a whole bunch of obligates. Um, and by that, I mean, they only eat ash. And yes, they will not do well if the ash goes down. Fortunately, there's still a lot of ash. They come back from root sprouts. Uh, whether they overcome the beetle, I don't know. It's anyone's guess, but yeah, great question. And certainly will be a lot of sufferers. Yeah, and I assume that um, all of those ash trees that are being treated with a systemic um, to prevent the ash borer, those are also probably killing off um, most of those uh, caterpillars that are feeding on the leaves at the same time? The initial prognosis on that, that's a great comment, uh, is not good. And you know where this really came out is with the, uh, I don't know about over there, but he, in parts of Ohio, we had a massive uh, periodical cicada emergence last year. It was fantastic. And they were just dropping dead out of those treated ash trees. So it was killing those. So you got to wonder what else is it going to kill? Um, some of you may have seen oh, birds. There was a lot of bird mortality, that mystery virus, they called it, or disease that was killing a lot of songbirds. That is starting to get linked back to the treatment of ash trees, at least in place, where they're eating insects like those cicadas that were uh, permeated with that toxin. So no, that's not a good thing. Interesting. Yeah, that's a lot to, lot to consider and, and tied up with invasive species there. So. Thank you for that. We had another question um, from a gardener. Many of us are gardeners, of course. Um, what do we do in, instead of harming the caterpillars that we see eating like our tomatoes down or, you know, man, a cabbage looper can really wreak havoc. <laughs> Is there anything that we can do to try to um, uh, walk the line there? Yeah, two, two notes on that one. Cabbage loopers, uh, you know, say la vie to those. Go ahead and off them. That's a cabbage white butterfly. It's a Eurasian species. Um, I wouldn't feel so bad. Here's my solution to the tomato problem. And I know they do great damage to those, but set aside some of your tomatoes just for them. Grow up some of those gorgeous Carolina Sphinx moss to go out and pollinate orchids and other flowers. And uh, yeah, it's a little loss on your part, but hey, let's face it, we 
took a lot of their habitat away to begin with. So the least we can do is give them a few tomatoes and then keep them off the other tomatoes. Just move them. They don't hurt you. You can pick them up. Move them over to the, the sacrificial tomatoes. That's my solution there. Great. Sacrificial tomatoes, everyone. That's what we need more of. <laughs> uh, let's see, it looks like uh, I've got one more question popped up here. Are there any migratory birds that nest in South America? If not, why do they all nest up north? Well, be, because of the climate in a nutshell, um, uh, where they winter in the tropics, that's food rich year round. So uh, general theory on that is, Say you're a scarlet tan, we have two tanagers, scarlet and summer tanager in Eastern US. If you go down to Ecuador or even Costa Rica, we're talking dozens, if not over a hundred tanager species, depending on where you are. So, you know, apparently a few managed, you know, they evolved this migration to uh, free themselves up from competition. That's a big part of it. But the big part is that our, our food crop of insects is only seasonal. So they could only migrate. And then thinking really, really long-term ebb and flow of plant communities, I mean, long-term, uh, it wasn't always that far apart. You know, this is a thing that happened probably sort of like fits and spurts in migration wasn't as long as eons ago. And over time, it's sprawled out to what it is now. So it's just, it's a really long-term evolutionary thing to exploit seasonal food crops, basically. Great. Um, let's see, I have another one pop up here. Many resources about native plants focus on individual plants and what conditions they need. However, I have trouble finding resources on plant communities and which plants grow best together. Any recommendations on resources there? Oh, man, she stumped me off the top of my head. It is a good question. Um, I will say that our Gardening for Moths book, um, isn't as dumb as it sounds. You know, it's not like I, my normal friends, but you, you're all normal too. But I mean, people who are like out of our world, they're like, what? What do you do now? Um, but it's really a, a, a template for doing what the questioner just asked, you know, um, and how these plants can interact and work with each other. Because I, I do believe in the construction of little communities of plants that would depend on each other. And you know, I'm just, I'm drawing a complete blank, although I'm sure there's books out that uh, detail that. So sorry, I can't think of one offhand. Buy our moth book, though, in July or August, whenever it comes out. That's great. I know I will be doing that. Um, thank you so much. It looks like we've we've answered all the questions that I had here pending. And um, thank you so much, Jim. This was a fascinating presentation. I'm so excited that we got to host you today. Well, thank you, Emily. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. We've done it. We have conference. I want to thank all of our uh, sponsors again, the National Wildlife Federation, Indy Zoo. Law firm Plews, Shadley, Rachel, and Ron, Central Indiana uh, Land Trust, Wild Birds Unlimited, Empower Results, Moving Waters Outfitters, Indiana Land Protection Alliance, or ILPA, uh, the Native Plants Unlimited, Native Plants Unlimited, Blue Aster Studios, the White River Alliance, and the Indiana Parks Alliance. You all can um, hang out if you are waiting to hear on, um, on anything with the uh, silent auction. We're going to turn over here to Ray and let him go through some of those winners. If you'd like to stay on for that, you're welcome to do so. But if you're ready to um, get on your day, you're 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 also welcome to cut and run. So thank you all for attending. Um, this this was a great morning, and I appreciate everyone um, getting online with us and spending the morning with these great speakers, Dr. Parker and Jim McCormick. McCormick, thanks so much. Ray, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, thank you, Emily, and thank you, everyone. So once again, we had another great silent auction. So I am happy to say we did beat last year's total. Overall, we raised $5,412. Get the right screen there. So thank you all for that. And without further ado, we will go through our list of winners. Um, just so all winners know, we will be reaching out to you to set up any kind of pickup for your winning items, um, smaller things we may mail, but we will reach out to you with how you will get your winning pieces. So first off on lot one, our Feed the Bees book, 
is going to Amber Slaughterbeck for $27. Our Attracting Native Pollinators book is going to Coralie Palmer for $32. Our butterfly book set is actually going to be for $46. The signed Joel Sartori sloth, sloth print is going to Jenny Jenkins for $150. One pack of the Ecology's card game and expansion is going to Julia Lowe. The other one is actually going to me, so $34 and $35 respectively on those. A four pack of tickets to the Children's Museum up in Fort Wayne is going to Cheryl Swift for $37. Our Indiana book set with a signed copy of Wake Up Woods and a brush with nature is going to Linda Stark for $46. Our brush with nature book by itself is going to Richard Myers for $28. A print of Bufflehead Ducks by Robin Myers is going to Felicia Tonis for $288. A framed woodblock print of Little White Church by Matt Reese is going to Felicia Tonis for $280. The one year family membership to Wolf Park is going to Tina Mayhern for $100. The Forest Awakens Needlepoint is going to Tracy Sets for $150. We have a 1976 Federal Duck Stamp print going to Tim Timothy Skyver for $135. The Guided Fishing Trip from Two Forks Guide Service is going to Dr. James Halleck for $500. Our Opossum gift set from Blue Aster Studios is going to Craig Carpenter for $75. Our Wildlife Habitat starter set is going to Richard Myers for $69. Our guided birding tour from Indigo Birding Tours is going to Gina Wayne Scott for $250. Guided Nature Hike for Four with Micah Moya to Lauren Lowry for $170. The Bloodroot Print is going to Janet Granger for $55. A Ross Reel Samarin Fly Reel is going to Craig Carpenter for $75. Fly Fishing Lessons and a Guided Trip is going to Richard Ford for $400. The Biplane Flight in a World War, II, World War II Navy Trainer is going to Lay Harden for $580. We have an Avari Fly Rod and a Veil Fly Reel set going to Jim Carpenter for $260. A guided herping trip with the Hoosier Herpetological Society is going to Tom Homan for $140. The Monarch Butterfly Stained Glass Garden Steak is going to Emily Wood for $135. We have a $150 State Parks Inn gift certificate going to Mary Meyer for $165. A pair of two tickets to an show this season at the Center for Performing Arts is going to Kim Brandt for $135. We have a 1983 Alabama duck stamp print going to Felicia Tonis for $60. A 1985 Alaska duck stamp print going to Dave Bloom for $80. The guided tour of IMS with Dave Calabro is going to Stephen Lavery for $300. And the guided smallmouth trip for with moving waters is going to Nate Lake for $300. So once again, thank you for everyone who bid. Thank you for all of our donors. Everybody have a wonderful thing. And I see Emily's already got her. So it's a good thing nobody outbid her. <laughs> thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. We're signing off now. And I'm so excited I won this. <laughs> thank you for coming, everyone.